Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon where you're at in, in the globe. Welcome to the July 2024 Hyperledger Financial Market Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. You probably heard Devin, James, and I just dating ourselves talking about interest rates when they were 9%. That, that's a side conversation. So um, before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the uh, Financial Markets Special Industry Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support and really making this meeting possible. I think we have a real interesting agenda. So let's just dive right in. As always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. We're showing the antitrust policy on the screen. It shows that we avoid discussions of company specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies and the code of conduct means that we uh, treat each other with respect. We never discriminate, we communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity and inclusion. Everyone's welcome to our meetings and this is intended to be an open forum for sharing ideas and having uh, constructive discussions. So if you are new, welcome. Uh, We'd also like to express our appreciation to the Hyperledger members. We showed the premier members and general members on the screen now. So just thank you for your support. Uh, if you're new to uh, this group, then welcome. Feel free to introduce yourself in, in the chat if there's anything you'd like to uh, for us to discuss now or in future meetings, please let us know. If this is your first time and you want to lurk and just sit in the background, that's also welcome as well. That's how I got introduced to this stuff, is being a lurker. Here's our agenda for today. So we've covered the introduction, and next we'll go over some Hyperledger community information. James will give us an update on blockchain in the mortgage industry. And then David Coleman, president of MISMO, and Devin Kasker, co-chair of Blockchain Community of Practice for MISMO, will discuss AI and blockchain from MISMO's perspective. And as always, we'll have a QA and a at the end, or if you have questions during the course, please let us know. We always cover this slide in each meeting, and this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey, but we may just be at different points along that path. This group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey and to demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases um, and define potential implementation paths for the mortgage industry. And if you need help on an implementation or just want to exchange thoughts with people, this is definitely the forum and please feel free to reach out to any and all of us. Okay, the next several slides I always mention, but I burned through those pretty quickly. Um, so if you're new to the group and would like more information, here are some of the sites that you can take a look at. Uh, the second one from the bottom we've highlighted, that's the mortgage subgroup wiki. James will talk about that in, in a bit more detail, but there's a wealth of information out there that's freely available and definitely avail yourself of that. To access that information, you will need an LFID. This slide shows how to access that really quick video, but I won't go through all of this. This information is available. Also, you can get a Hyperledger Fabric certification, shows your competency and the fact that you're knowledgeable about this particular technology. Blockchain training. I always advocate for this because this is how I got familiar with Hyperledger. This information is free and it's very, very approachable and it's how I got up to speed. So definitely uh, use this information if you want to get started on learning about blockchain and Hyperledger specifically. So with that, um, we did want to mention this is our 30th Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup meeting. When we started this group in April, excuse me, in August 2021, that seemed like it was forever ago. Um, I can say that personally, I've learned a lot and I hope we've made a positive impact on the industry. From the start, this group has been intended to educate and assist the mortgage community about blockchain. So thank you. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to my good friend, James. 
Marvin, thank you. So, wow, this is our 30th session. Session, You know, when I think back to 2021, when we hosted our initial presentation, and to see where we've come throughout the years, it's kind of hard to believe. Um, it's been an incredible journey connecting with people across numerous sectors of the industry. And most importantly, I think, is introducing technology innovations that really have the ability to change the future of the mortgage industry. So, you know, for me, a special thank you to Hyperledger for their support and providing the platform. You know, a, a special thank you to our presenters. We've had several dozen of them over the years. And most importantly, to our attendees. So both you that attend live for these sessions, as well as individuals that are streaming it online through YouTube. It's really through your participation that makes all of this happen. So, you know, on a monthly basis, we do updates on what's going on in the mortgage industry. Um, you know, we have looked at this from a global perspective. We've pretty much covered every continent except for Alaska or not Alaska, Antarctica uh, over the years. And I am still looking for blockchain relevant to real estate in Antarctica. I found it relevant for other things. But that someday I am hoping to bring those to you. But Marvin, let's go ahead and jump into the first set of articles. So wanted to start out with JP Morgan. So as we've discussed in previous presentations, major financial institutions are directing efforts towards advancing proof, proof of concept developed through Project Guardian. So as a reminder, Project Guardian started back in May of 2022 as a collaborative effort involving key players such as JP Morgan, DBS Bank, SBI Digital Asset Holdings, and Wisdom Tree. The project explores the potential of decentralized finance applications and asset tokenization in wholesale funding markets, with a primary focus on developing open and interoperable networks, institutional grade DeFi products, asset tokenization, and trusted infrastructure. Onyx, J.P. Morgan's platform, is exploring the insights gathered from its pilot program with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. We actually talked about this uh, last year and turning that into tangible products. In addition, Wisdom Tree is working on pro providing diverse on-chain services through a unified interface for all of its clients. The company aims to integrate tokenized portfolios and trading banking services into a single application, enhancing financial management capabilities. Tokenization of money market funds presents opportunities to take advantage of stable coins as well, offering new avenues for diversification and risk management. So if you'd like to find out more about what's going on with Project Guardian, do take a look at this article. Over in the uh, AI world, Morgan Stanley's been leading the market a little, little bit. So Morgan Stanley's Wealth Management announced a milestone in its AI at Morgan Stanley suite of Gen AI tools. The new AI at Morgan Stanley Debrief is an open AI powered tool that generates notes and surfaces action items. So after a meeting, Debrief will basically summarize all the key points from the meeting. It'll create an email for the advisor that they can then edit and send at their discretion. And it'll even save notes to other applications such as Salesforce. This allows financial advisors to to service, advise, and build relationships with clients through more of a human touch. Feedback from the financial advisor teams has been overwhelmingly positive. In March of 2023, Morgan Stanley Wealth Management announced its relationship with OpenAI as its only wealth management strategic partner. In September of last year, Morgan Stanley fully rolled out the AI Morgan Stanley Assistant, it's a Gen AI powered chatbot offering financial advisors quick access to all Morgan Stanley's intellectual capital. capital. And to date, 98% of financial advisor teams have adopted the assistant. So kind of a different angle on uh, how AI is used in the industry. But as we move forward, I anticipate we're going to see more and more of these concepts come into fruition. Uh, Marvin, let's move on to the next set. So this next article comes to us from uh, the Blockchain Council. It was on LinkedIn. 
<clears throat> really kind of addressing the two different points of what are blockchain's contributions to AI and how does AI enhance blockchain? So looking at it from a blockchain contribution perspective, the article really focuses on the strengthening of AI data security and how AI systems thrive on data. As AI systems processes increasing amounts of data, its intelligence grows over time. And through distributed ledger, blockchain ensures data remains immutable, preventing tampering. It also helps facilitate transferring data sharing. So blockchain's decentralized nature allows data exchange across various nodes without a single point of failure. And lastly, in the blockchain space, it really is focusing on how these capabilities are particularly useful for collaborative AI, where shared, learned, and data access are essential for improving algorithmic outcomes. In addition, the article covers AI enhancements for blockchain, how AI can boost blockchain efficiency. Um, blockchain processes are very resource intensive, as we know. AI streamlines these by introducing smart algorithms that automate tasks significantly, speeding up transactions, and reducing energy consumption. Um, we also talk, or the article also talks about how AI improves blockchain security. So AI can fortify blockchain security by employing machine learning techniques. AI systems can detect and react to security threats in real time. Uh, the article at the end covers a variety of case scenarios in the healthcare industry uh, supply chain, as well as in the financial sector. So do take a look at it. It's a great article on how AI and blockchain can collaborate together. And actually, for our final article, I'm going to pass it over to Mark D'Angelo. Mark's uh, been a presenter with us previously. He is a frequent uh, publisher for the MBA. This article actually is um, his most recent publication to the MBA. And Mark, I'll pass it over to you for a couple minutes. Thank you, James. Thank you, Marvin, for, for having me back. Uh, I hate to say it, uh, it's probably, you know, 20 years I've written for Newslink uh, on a monthly basis. So I have, I have a fair number out there. Uh, this is indeed the most recent, but um, it's really focused on the idea that um, looking at AI, looking at systems and data uh, moving forward in the mortgage industry, more than likely what we're seeing is a step shift. Uh, this is not necessarily an application ideation that people have gotten used to when fintech and regtech and all this stuff came to be. It's actually a shift of how do we provision our systems, looking more from a data perspective first, uh, an integrity and ethics, a sourcing capability, a mesh, a virtualization, all those fun things that we talk about uh, as technologists um, versus a process. Uh, we are always focused on process. We're always focused on the vendor, the outsourcer, the efficiencies. AI in this case often represents a step function shift. And I think that's where the industry in this particular article says, do you understand what your baseline data is? Do you understand that this is probably something different, not just for the industry, but for the consumers itself, for the entire supply chain of information, going from customer contact to origination to servicing to securitization and back into the markets again? So all this is, is trying to bring it together is, is basically the title here, borrowing from Star Wars and our friend Yoda, um, is basically, it's not a, a, um, something that we can just, you know, flip a switch or do incremental improvements. This is a fundamental shift. And two things, and I'll, I'll give it back to you and, and, and let our, our, uh, our experts at MISMO talk about uh, their, their view on this. Um, I've got um, recently uh, Thomson Reuters, uh, Thomson Reuters Institute in particular, came to me about a year ago and asked me to speak to all their clientele around the, around the world. So I actually had the honor to go speak to all the heads of audit and tax in this country. So Ernst & Young, KPMG, Deloitte's, uh, all the big players of the industry and talk about what AI and education and skill sets really are going to mean. And that, that led into a, um, I'm a contributing monthly author for Reuters, uh, Reuters Institute in particular, all focused on artificial intelligence and what that does to the organization, what that does to the processes, what that does to how the business models operate. So if you're looking for more than one view, and this is just a quick blip snapshot type of approach, 
Um, this really talks about getting your baseline. Where do you want to go in the future? There's other things that that have to be considered. This is not a one and done uh, type of situation. And so my second point on this is oftentimes we, uh, and I have this discussion with the, the Reuters folks and people at Georgetown and even Case Western where I, where I uh, helped the professors kind of make practicality of some of this, is that um, we often get into the idea that everything's gen AI. Uh, and, and Gen AI is the latest and greatest tool. Uh, being a computer scientist for 40 years by education, by practice, being a prior CIO and CTO for Aqua and all those fun things that I've done in my life. Um, the idea here is that we are now evolving AI and AI has been there for 40 years. We started this with neural networks, the tech, the tools, the capabilities, the processes, the data standards we didn't have all these years ago. Things are now coming together that are going to accelerate this. And that's how this article really came to be is saying, you've got to understand that, yes, it's frustrating because we have different terms. Yes, it's frustrating because it's a different focus. Yes, it's frustrating because how do we get the skills and 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 teaching uh, the Gen Alphas and the Gen Zs in my world, you know, as an adjunct, it, it's an interesting perspective. And how do I get that industry knowledge? And that's where this article really focuses in is saying, it's not necessarily about the tech. It really is about the data. It's about the data standards, about the interoperability. And Wall Street Journal last week really brought this whole thing to uh, closure is that we are now evolving from the Gen AI world using LLMs, large language models, into industry ring fence type of approaches. Because again, 40% of the data for the industry only exists within our industry. Where's that other 60% coming from? That's where the LLMs and all the idea of bias and specialization and training and filtering and all these things that we talk about are so key. But the reality is, is that the industry is finally saying, we need to bring this back in because we have our own data. We need to ring fence this. We need to understand it. And we don't then have to spend hundreds of millions to get this thing trained. Maybe it's only a couple million. Maybe we partner, if I'm an independent mortgage banker, with other independent mortgage bankers. Maybe I look to the association. Whatever the case use cases are going to be, we're now bringing this in. And that's why I say it is not we're going to do this and try and dip our toes in the you know in the water like we do with fintech and and reg tech. This is a fundamental shift, and and I think the industry after three years of contraction and flatlining, it's a perfect opportunity to look at things going forward. Mark, thank you very much for that excellent uh, overview. In fact, Marvin and I were just talking recently. We need to invite you back and have you host a session on all the stuff that you're doing. I, I did get a chance to check out the video links that you're working on that you saw. Oh, out. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, That's... I'm, I'm sto yeah, I'm storytelling for. I'm trying to get the MBA to pick up the. I'm using synthetic humans to tell the yeah. articles, so that's yeah. a different mindset to say I'm going to do it in three minutes versus try to get all this stuff that's taken me decades to create, and I'm using AI to help generate the scripts for AI actors, and, and so this is the whole different of how we engage people, how we how we do things differently, and so. Um, and again, that was, uh, those of you that remember Mike Sorahan from all those uh, a year or two ago, uh, Mike had um, put me on the bubble back in 22 for MBA annual. And he says, I want you to create a report that is going to shake the industry. He says, and, and, and I came up with some, you know, tech head kind of a, a title. Mike says, no, he says, it's going to be called adapt or die. And and so actually, when we look at this, that's what I sent you the links for is kind of the update for Adapt or Die saying, we didn't have this capability even two years ago. But if you look at the process mindset, this stuff is really going to, with AI layered on top of it, data is going to completely transform how we use data in an industry that is still struggling with where does it come from? Oh, it's origination. I only need 200 and some odd field. That's it. I need servicing. Well, maybe not. And so these are the kinds of things that um, uh, would be interesting to talk about, especially when we start linking in the uh, immutability of the data assets, the ethical sourcing of that information, the sharing for revenues, all those good things. Yeah, fantastic, Mark. As I said, we'll, we'll definitely be having you back on the, the broadcast. 
Um, you know, lastly, what you're all seeing on the screen, this is the mortgage industry subgroup wiki. Um, uh, Mar our Alma is dropping a link down in the, the chat for everybody. Um, as Marvin mentioned, in the upper right hand corner, that's how you can set up your free LFID. Um, on the left hand side of the wiki, we do have recordings of all 30 of these sessions. So if you're interested in seeing some of our previous recordings, check those out. Also, for the uh, updates in the mortgage industry, you know, over the last several years, I was looking at this yesterday, we have actually um, culminated over 330 different articles on blockchain and AI within the industry. So if you're looking for additional information that's not available on the site, feel free to reach out to us at uh, any time. Marvin, I'd be happy to provide that for you. Other than that, Marvin, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our guest speakers. Thanks, James, and thank you, Mark. Uh, always a pleasure hearing uh, your thoughts and definitely would like to have you back for a more in-depth discussion. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, the gentleman from MISMO, David Coleman, president of MISMO since April 2023. Prior to MISMO, David was an advisor and consultant for the mortgage industry. He was also a managing director with KPMG and their mortgage advisory practice and Managing Director with Newbold Advisors. Our other MISMO speaker is Devin Castor. In addition to his position as Senior Principal Product Management at CoreLogic, uh, Devin is also the co-chair of the Blockchain Community Practice for MISMO. Prior to his current role, he was the founder and CEO of Recruited, uh, a recruiting startup. I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Devin. He has also uh, written and spoken extensively on blockchain. I've followed Devin for a while now, and he has great insight into blockchain in the mortgage industry. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining. And David, do I hand it off to you? Sure, that sounds good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good deal. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having us today. I very much appreciate the invitation. Um, you know, there's a couple of things going on as, as you know, you look at the industry and, and you know, I, I think Mark, you touched on a few of these things is, is there's this interconnection of things coming together where, you know, one or alone couldn't, you know, it couldn't exist several years ago. It, it's taken the, you know, the convergence of, of things to, uh, to get us to where we are. Um, first of all, just a brief introduction on MISMO. For those of you uh, that don't know MISMO, we are the uh, mortgage mortgage standards organization for the industry. So, you know, we maintain the, we've got the, the data model for the industry. And I know that's important, both from a blockchain and an AI standpoint uh, that, that maps out the, the data model for the industry. Uh, it's foundational for the various trans transactions that are, you know, that, that, that flow from the front of the origination process all the way through to servicing and disposition, as well as uh, everything in between. So, uh, we have worked with the industry. We've got um, over 2,000 members, but we've got about 580 uh, to 600 active volunteers that, that uh, participate on a regular basis. Uh, we've got 39 work groups and communities of practice that uh, you know cover with, cover a range from you know blockchain, which uh, Devin Devin leads, to smart docs to servicing, up to our most recent edition of community of practice around AI, um, which let me get off, let me talk just a little bit about AI. And I think there's a, you know, a couple of pieces here. One is from a, from a MISMO standpoint, um, we started getting quite a bit of, uh, you know, re request activity, whatnot early last year, you know, shortly after, uh, of course, OpenAI put out chat, chat GBT. And, um, you know, it was, uh, they're looking to us to, Kind of provide a founded a forum for discussion of AI to say, you know, how does this, um, you know, I, you know, what should the industry be looking at? What, you know, what is it? How does it work? Where does it go? Um, things along those lines. And and I have to say that we kicked off. We had an AI forum in September of last year that uh, we had kind of a who's who of uh, participants ranging from you know AWS and Google to you know, to, to Rocket and other large lenders, to service providers. We even had um, two, uh, two U.S. senators' offices participate to start talking about pretending, you know, potential legislation around AI. 
So it was really as a well attended and well received session, um, followed up by uh, intermittent by interim meetings within the MISMO membership around AI at a, at a second AI forum in um, San Francisco early June of this year. Um, and within that period of time, which for about nine months, we saw a significant shift from uh, what is AI, what, 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 should, what should I be looking at, where should I use it at, things like that, to, okay, what are people doing? What should I be doing? What are my peers doing? Let me understand where AI is actually being used in the industry. And with that, it's, it's interesting because I think if you're outside of the industry, you have this, this impression that we're, we're eliminating all the people and we're going to turn underwriting over to AI and, you know, lights out and, and we're going forward. So it's, you know, you know, as you well know, it's, it's couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, we've seen a couple of uh, significant uses for AI to start off with. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the um, one of the areas where um, lenders and service providers and others are adopting AI rather quickly is in uh, assistance around development. So, you know, you know, basically giving it to their developers to assist and, and streamline and make it more efficient in uh, in developing the code. Second area is um, supplementing uh, the chatbots that they have on their, their websites, things along those lines. Again, not making any decisions, but uh, providing guidance and providing a better, better experience for the, for the consumer. And then the, the third one, which I think, uh, I think you'll see kind of, kind of diminish over time is, is reading documents. So, you know, as you well know, the mortgage industry is still very, you know, heavy for do document-based uh, world. And so, um, you know, you may put data into systems, but what's the first thing you do once you put the data in? You print it off on a piece of paper and you pass it down the line. So, uh, we're really seeing kind of, you know, big advancement in AI for reading of, uh, of documents and, you know, take it, put it back into uh, <laughs> in the data and, uh, you know, running, running, uh, Running processes from that standpoint, but those are the those are the major areas. We've got some other people that are kind of you know um, you know playing in a couple of other areas. Play is not the right word, but experimenting in other areas. Uh, but you know, as far as turning over decision making without a human in the loop, um, I don't see that happening. At, you know, at least in the you know in the foreseeable future, anyway. Um, you know, from a from a standpoint, one of the other areas where you know, we're starting to see a little more activity is around, um, you know, the uh, smart docs. And I mentioned it earlier, and it, and it plays, you know, fits directly into blockchain. It fits directly into AI. Uh, it's a way to, to put together a, uh, a print image and a data file together in a uh, single, uh, you know, single file so that you can look at it, you can process it, you move it along without, you know, without producing a piece of paper. So, you know, I think that, you know, where I'm starting to see more engagement there is it is um, another way to start, you know, coming up with reliable ways to, to move data through the, through the life cycle. So, you know, we're starting to see more activity in that area. But um, with, with that, I know, um, you know, Devin's been, been leading, uh, been co-leading on blockchain for, with MISMO for quite a while now. I, I don't remember exactly how long, but, um, I'll let him, I'll turn it over to him here, and he's, he's the expert for us. That's a, one thing about MISMO is we've got, with 580 volunteers across 39 communities of practice and work groups, we've got experts from across the industry that are participating in these various areas. So uh, it means that I don't need to know this stuff. I just need to know who, who has it, right? So with that, Devin, thanks for joining me for, uh, for this session, and let me turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, David. I appreciate it. Um... As um, Marvin had introduced me, my name is Devin Castor. I am the uh, co-chair of the MISMO Blockchain Community of Practice. Um, I, you know, thank you for actually pronouncing the name of my prior startup correctly, Marvin. Not too many people. I, I almost had to go through a rebranding because they they couldn't seem to get the phonetic spelling and recruited. Um, but that was just my one single attempt to get out of the mortgage industry. I've been in the mortgage industry itself for 31 years now. Um, spent a very long time on the lending side before moving over into solidly into the technology side. I've been with CoreLogic for about 12 years now. Um, but 
I've been involved with the blockchain community of practice for about two and a half years now. The, um, the community itself was started in 2018. And just to give some quick, um, you know, idea of, you know, when everyone thinks of MISMO, they think immediately of data standards, which we are a huge data standards group, right? We, we fill the huge need that was, that was there. Well, I, I think it's been what over 20 years now um, to really bring some level of data standardization into the industry at a time when it, you know, everyone was kind of either relying on Fannie's data standards with the three, two files, et cetera. But we filled that need and, and, and really created those data standards. However, it's not just about data standards. We, we have quite a few groups that are also what we call technology enablement groups. So that includes blockchain, but the new AI group is certainly going to be more of a technology enablement group. Um, we also have APIs, which is, you know, much more common today, but we're really in that area focusing on how do we really take MISMO's data standards and then spin those into usable APIs that that fit within within those standards. So it's really blockchain falls into the technology enablement. It was, as I said, formed in 2018. Prior to that, it was a topic of fairly continual conversation in the emerging tech community of practice, which is one where we really discuss any, the the phrase emerging tech can certainly be very misleading. I think um, my co-chair on blockchain, Sean Job, loves my recent comment that I made that it's not really emerging tech, but it's still emerging tech and mortgage. So a um, lot of talk, take a lot of close looks in that group around what is new technology coming up? Does it have a place in, in mortgage? And it blockchain was just so frequent a conversation during during that period that it was decided it really needed to be spun up to its own group. The original charter was really being able to take a look at okay, what are what are the use cases in mortgage that blockchain can be applied to? Is there any opportunity for standardization within blockchain itself? Um, and it's just it's evolved over time. So I mean, we've over the last couple of years we. I know it was it was a topic on, on one of these calls with the white paper we put out. Um, that was actually about a year and a half effort to get that paper written and through all the various approval processes and get it out there. But that was focused really heavily on just trying to provide some education to the industry as well as as give the viewpoint of Mismo on blockchain, right? Which was we we see it as a very viable technology. It has a tremendous potential use within the mortgage industry. Everyone on this this group certainly fully understands that. Um, but the other big part that that we try to really we've done some prototyping um, going back to that original that slide near the beginning that that Marvin was going over with the various phases of of types of work we go through. Very similarly, we've worked on several prototypes. We've done one that was you know, worked with TRID and, and various compliance efforts around that. We built a prototype. It's casually referred to as the servicing transfer prototype, but it really involved transferring of uh, an exchange of data across party, multiple parties in, in the process. So we've done various types of prototyping. Um, our biggest focus, though, is really still on education. Um, it's still... For me, the largest impediment in our industry is just people just don't still don't understand blockchain, right? Most of it still comes out as, oh, so we're going to put crypto in mortgage or, oh, it's just that's that solution that's looking for a problem. There's there's just such a steep curve still. Um, a lot of that's really more on the business side of the world because, I mean, they're the ones that that have to really be able to understand this stuff and agree that it is viable. Um, but even on the tech side, I, I've actually had conversation with seasoned architects that make the comment I just said about, oh, that's just the solution looking for a problem. Like you of all people really should know better than that. But so we, we've got a lot of focus on education. Um, just some examples of that. The last couple of summits, um, we, we did lunch and learn sessions. The first one was very, very, very highly attended, um, surprisingly. 
where we took a deep dive into decentralized identifiers and um, self-sovereign um, identities. And that was very well received, but we got feedback that people really wanted to get a little deeper into just understanding the basics of blockchain. So the last summit we did a another lunch and learn session where I finally was able to find a way to tell a analogous story using absolutely no technology terms whatsoever to explain how blockchain works. And it was the first time I finally saw light bulbs going on around the room. It, it created a lot of conversation, a lot of, I mean, really great conversation with people seeing, I can see how this could be used in this area or in this area. So again, a lot of focus on education in our COP meeting at the last summit. I did, I led a discussion on you know, kind of timely for what we're talking about here about the convergence of AI and blockchain. Um, I, I will definitely have to read that blockchain council paper. Um, but I fully agreed, not just the convergence, but they are symbiotic technologies. I mean, a big thing that we've tried to certainly break through is, is helping people understand that none of these, whether it's blockchain, um, distributed ledger technology, AI, gen AI, any of, none of it is a solve all technology, right? They're all, the tech stack of the future is gonna have to include both of those along with lots of other different types of tech, right? When we start looking at AR and VR and, and spatial computing and all of these things, that is the tech stack of the future and you can't really be looking at any one at any given time. Um, so, Again, really right now, we're we're still, half of our focus is on education. The other half has still been working on prototypes. We've recently reached a bit of an inflection point, I'd say, where we're finding the prototypes we were trying to start building now require, we, we can't get away with freeware anywhere, anymore to actually build some of the stuff we're doing. Uh, most of our recent prototypes have been focused on interoperability. We recognize fully the fact that this industry is going to have numerous implementations of blockchain. Interoperability is critical and, and being able to utilize MISMO work products is the focus of, of those prototypes we've been working on to show how MISMO standards can help bridge that gap in interoperability between multiple chains. Um, in the meantime, we're, we're still discovering standards as we work on those prototypes. But I mentioned we were at that inflection point since we're getting to a point where it's difficult to do it with a lot of freeware, we're starting to move a little more towards theoretical and conceptual work. So we're, we're in discussions right now to start shifting away from actually working on prototypes because a lot of in a lot of cases, especially when we pull that back over to the education side, it's really difficult to, to show off to not the non-blockchain initiated via a prototype what it's actually doing and why it why it works the way it works. So we're we're gonna likely start moving into a little more on the theoretical and conceptual side and of course continue to to educate the industry. So that's kind of pretty much where we're at today. Um I you know if if there's any questions about that I'm I'm more than welcome to to answer those but I Devin, I, I do have a couple of questions. All the terms you threw out, I mean, I, I'm like a dog with my ears perked up because you hit upon all of the terms and, and issues that we've been talking about and I think our uh, members are interested in. And let me just start off with interoperability. That's one of the biggest issues around blockchain. And we all know about provenance with what they're doing um, and figure with Stellar still out there. These are some fairly significant blockchains and potentially the 800 pound gorillas within the mortgage industry. And talk to me about how MISMO can form the basis of interoperability because you can't be interoperable with those other blockchains unless you have data standards. And this is something exactly. that uh, Mark D'Angelo was talking about as well. It all begins with the data. Yep. And, and that's, I mean, the, that was the big focus of the current prototype we were working on, which really made very heavy use of MISMO's API toolkit, which using that API toolkit, you're able to take the XML, you know, the MISMO base schema and actually utilizing our tools, to convert those into MISMO compliant APIs that then allow that transfer of data in between the two. So that was a big 
focus point of it. Of course, we're also trying to make sure we're incorporating the MISMO um, life alone modeling so that we're, we're also keeping those types of things in mind as well, right? A lot of this is going to be event-driven exchanges of data between, you know, various blockchains. So really that API toolkit is very key. I think the API toolkit can lead to far more. Um, I've, you know, we've also been beginning to talk a bit about, I mean, it's, it's one thing don't see a lot of getting back to talking about the convergence of you know, AI and blockchain. There, there's a lot of opportunity to be able to use generative AI to take data coming from one blockchain, convert it into the necessary schemas for the other blockchain, right? It's going to be a lot easier if those data standards are already in place in those various blockchains. But if they're not, that is a, a very viable means by which to transform that data into the appropriate schema. So we're, we're looking at a lot of different aspects of that right now. That using generative AI for that transfer of knowledge, that, that's an excellent idea. That's the first time I, I've actually heard of AI being used in that fashion. And I'm sure there are people on this call right now that are taking notes like, oh, okay, we got to take a look at that. Um, let me uh, throw another question out at you. Since you've been working within blockchain for quite a few years as well, uh, as have James and I, we've seen the discussion evolve from crypto mortgages two and a half years ago, everyone wanted to do a crypto mortgage. Now, no one will even take your call if you want to talk about crypto mortgage. And, and it's more along the lines of tokenization. Everyone's talking about tokenization uh, of real world assets. In what does MISMO think about that evolution from the discussion perspective? And are you guys seeing anyone actually doing tokenization of mortgages? I, mean, I know Figure is, I and mean, who else is doing that out there? Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if certainly Figures is one of the leaders in that space. Liquid, formerly Liquid Mortgage, now Liquid Fi, is also yeah. a tremendous leader in, in tokenization of mortgage assets. Um, I think, I, I don't know if, he, if he's on, I, I saw him on the attendee list, but Hexel blockchain is also working in um, tokenization of mortgages. Um, it, it is, for me, I mean, we, we've certainly, I, I did a, a session on tokenization a couple of, of summits ago within our, our regular COP meeting, really taking a look at, I mean, that it's kind of the, it's the shiny object, right? It's where really the 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 end goal is to get to that point where you can not just tokenize the mortgage asset, you can tokenize the mortgage asset, you can tokenize the servicing asset, you can securitize and, and tokenize a security as well, fractionalize it, really increase liquidity in the market by the speed at which you'll be able to securitize and fractionalize. So there's so much involved in that. I think, again, though, I think that's really kind of the, the end game. I think that's where a lot of folks are running to right now. I, I But back to where a lot of this conversation was really revolved around it. We got to get the data under control yeah. first though right and and to me that's still being able to utilize blockchain to get to a trusted data ecosystem in the in the mortgage industry that's what's going to allow you to really truly get to that 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 shiny object of the tokenization right because the tokens are great but uh, you and i had a brief conversation um tokenization is I, I think a lot of people tend to look at it on a fairly simplistic level. They're like, well, it's a mortgage, it's an asset, it's got ownership and it's got value. So let's tokenize it. But it it really, when you really start peeling the, the onion back, there is a lot of complexity there, right? I mean, even looking at, I mean, there's plenty of companies out there tokenizing real estate. Um, most of that tokenization I've seen is is really revolved around commercial real estate, right? Which it's it's not that too complex to, you know, tokenize a commercial investment framework around a commercial building, right? But as soon as you start looking at property and mortgages and all the, the complexities that brings into a tokenization effort, it, it does become much more complex. And I think that's one of the big things I, I certainly urge through our discussions about tokenization at MISMO is, making sure you're keeping in mind those complexities that that underline that effort. 
and, and I think kind of embedded in, in that term of complexity is the regulatory aspect, which a lot of yep. people haven't really thought about. I, I know that I've just started to delve into that. The regulatory aspect of tokenization, I, I think, is the long hole in the tent. If you don't solve that, you're not going to get anywhere. And I'd be really interested to find out how these larger companies like the figure, like the liquefy, how they've solved that, the regulatory aspect. Well, I, I will dip my toe into that a little bit. So when, when you look at figure as an example, figure initially really started out focused on mortgages. Yep. As, as the volume started drying up, they, they saw it as a perfect opportunity to hop over the fence into HELOCs and really focus their business on HELOCs. Now, although HELOCs are semi-federally regulated, they are not federally backed, right? So you don't have a Fannie or a uh, Freddie or a Ginny, although obviously Freddie just announced that they're they're going to start actually getting into um, HELOCs and, and backing that that market. But there's there's no you don't need necessarily need to get in with the regulators and get a lot of approval on a financial asset that's not being backed by the federal government, whether it's through one of those GSEs or through Ginny May or or through other um, various entities that would be involved in that. Now, on the liquid mortgage side, they put all their focus into non-conforming lending, right? So they're they're they've you know partnered up pretty heavily with um, Redwood Trust, which is all portfolio lending. So again. Now you're getting into private mortgages that aren't necessarily backed by the federal government. You do have to deal with some regulation on it, but since they're being traded in a private market, you don't end up with a lot of involvement from the various entities you'd normally see, right? So that's, I think why, that's where, where we've been unable to cross over, I think from those private markets to private products, um, obviously the HELOCs, as I talked about, and really over into the conforming and conventional loan markets, it's going to take involvement from all kinds of parties, right? You've got not just the Fannies, Freddies, and Jennies, you've got the SEC, you've got all kinds of regulatory agencies, the CFPB, that are going to have to actually get involved. And that's got to be done in tandem with trying to build this technology for that use case, right? Because if, if, you know, my favorite story is always when I take a look at what happened with um, Maersk when, when they tried to launch their big shipping blockchain initiative. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great idea. I mean, there was no better use case for, for blockchain, but once they got it out there and tried to really launch it, they ran into, I forgot how many hundreds of countries had regulations that wouldn't allow them to do what they could do. So it it fell to the side. So it's it's got to be. It can't be a afterthought. It's it has to be a forethought with the, the regulatory approaches. That and I'm yeah. glad you brought up that Maris example. We actually discussed that in in one of the previous uh, mortgage subgroup sessions. And, and I know I've been kind of monopolizing uh, you, Devin. So James, or if anyone else uh, on the call would would like to ask Devin or or David any questions please feel free to do so. I, I know I get super excited about this stuff. I, I know I'm kind of weird that way, but it, to me, the, this is just some really exciting and interesting things. Yeah, Devin, great presentation. Um, you know, from our perspective, I love to see what MISMO is doing on that whole education front, getting the knowledge out there. That's exactly what we're looking to do through the the Hyperledger Foundation here. And, you know, it's interesting as you make the comments about, you know, people start talking about blockchain in the mortgage industry. And the first thing they think about are crypto loans. You know, Marvin and I are constantly out there that, you know, it's that finger and thumb analogy that all crypto are blockchains, but not all yeah. blockchains are crypto. So we're yeah. constantly trying to drill that message out there. But, you know, I know myself and, you know, probably a lot of our uh, attendees would be interested. You you were talking about the GSEs. Does MISMO coordinate anything with the GSEs on where you guys are heading, where they're heading from a, you know, new technology perspective? Um, I, I can, Absolutely. I can I'm going to let David speak to that. Yeah, yeah I, I can grab that one. Um, both the GSEs, both Fannie and Freddie, but and don't forget the federal home loan banks, are all members of and and Ginny yeah. May 
Jenny May as well. And Jenny May, yeah. And uh, BA. And <laughs> yeah. but in any case, we, you get all the all the federal soup in, and they they're very active within um, with, within MISMO. Uh, as far as the uh, you know Fannie and Freddie, they have uh, basically the U program, which is basically their version of MISMO transactional uh, specifications that are models that were built off of the MISMO data model, but particular to uh, Fannie and Freddie, so that they had, had common transactions. Um, they're also involved in the various work groups and communities of practice, um, you know, where they have, they participate, you know, clearly there, you know, there's two, two things they do. One is they look out for their interests, obviously. Um, but secondly is they, they've got a large contingent of folks that are, you know, that they've assigned to work with MISMO, um, you know, six, eight, 10 people show up at a, at a MISMO summit from each of the GSEs uh, actively participating across various work groups. So they are, uh, they're very, very heavily involved in, uh, in what we're doing within, um, within MISMO. And, and I would, I would say, you know, looking at it from from the blockchain angle i think the best thing i can do is is put him on the spot omar is actually on this call omar is with uh Ginny may and he has been a very very involved participant in our blockchain community of practice over time so i, I don't know if you want to say anything omar but feel free no you have covered this well uh, Devin, and uh, we are very uh, active in the blockchain and definitely with MESMO, and we have been working with MESMO since the inception of MESMO. So really appreciate what Janice Davis is doing for us. So thanks, Devin. Thanks, team. And looking forward to more collaboration on this. Yeah. Actually, that brings up a great topic, too. So for people that are interested in getting involved and participating, what's the, the best avenue for them to pursue? Well, so it, it's really... Oh, go ahead, David. Now go ahead, Devin. No, I was just going to say, I mean, certainly we we really want to see a lot more involvement, especially across those in, in the blockchain community as a whole, getting involved with that community of practice, um, getting involved with MISMO itself, I'll let David speak to, but I will be sure to get over to you, James and Marvin, the, um, the information for actually signing up for the community of practice when we meet. Um, all the all the basics on that because we'd we'd love to see folks from this group getting involved in that for sure yeah yeah and let me let me follow up on that just a little bit is um from mismo we would love to have everyone as members however you don't have to be a member of mismo to participate in the work groups you can't vote when it comes down to um you know making decisions for the group but you can actively participate within the groups without actually being a member of MISMO. Um, one of the things you may want to look at is we have a summit coming up August 26th through 29th. Um, it'll be in the DC area. And you know, for those of you that are familiar with the DC area, it'll be in Reston Town Center, which is a, a great setting both from a you know from a place to go for a for a summit as well as you know the facilities themselves. So uh, we'd love to have you there. Um, if you go to mismo.org, there's information on all of the work groups, information on how to join uh, MISMO, contact information for the MISMO team. Uh, and then myself, please feel free to reach out directly to me if you have any questions or you know, anything that I can, can help you with, because um, I'm you know, more than happy to, uh, to, to do so. And I think Mark D'Angelo had one uh, had a follow up question or another question. Mark? Well, yeah, thank you. Um, just a different question, and and this is for um, you know standards and kind of going forward with AI. If you look at and again, not everybody's going to be familiar with this probably, but if you look at the idea between ethical sourced or compartmentalized data using federated AI, basically what you're doing is not putting the data down the stream, but you have all these different AI systems. So you could have the GSEs with theirs, you could have uh, other vendors, other servicers, if you're in their origination, you're transferring that information. The idea here is not to 
transfer all the information, but to say, go to a trusted source and say, okay, we understand this is ethically sourced. We understand this is validated. Maybe it's blockchain, maybe it's something else. It's a mutable asset of some type. How does this play into what MISMO is thinking? Because again, this I look at kind of what you folks have done over the last 20 years. And again, I was part of that generation when you guys started. Um, you know, it, it's all this foundational, great information, great capabilities, but how do we use that going forward? And this is Marvin's point. You've got all these, these folks kind of doing different things out there with different standards, different ways of implementation. Where does this all come together, especially when you have AI systems now starting to talk to AI systems and it cascades across the enterprise? So if I made a mistake in, in point A and it's now point 23 down the line, how do I rectify that? What's the consumer do? How do all the standards and things you're working on with the 500 and some participants start to recognize kind of this evolving data technical landscape that seems to be coming in a fire hose type of approach? Devin, you want to take no. a shot at that? Question? No, I was I was actually going to let you start with that, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, actually, let, let me let me start with that, and then Devin, please jump in. You know, the you know, I think that what we provide, Mark, you know this foundationally, is the logical data model, which provides here's here's what data looks like, here's how it's described, you know, here's the allowable content, which is is clearly as pivotal from from an AI standpoint. So if we've got the world speaking in, in the MISMO language, that's that's the starting point. Uh, second thing is that, you know, I think less and less with AI, you know, the, the concept of transactions starts to go away, right? You, you know, transactions exactly. are you know, very linear in nature um, versus if you've just got data and you know the source of the data and where it comes from, then, you know, then that is, you know, your, your AIs can talk to AIs and go get data. But again, back to the same, you know, logical data model. You know, one thing I did, did touch on was we are doing work right now on um, a new version of Smart Docs, which is using, you know, PDF and with the data behind it in a uh, tamper, tamper proof or tamper evident package that, you know, allows data that has been, you know, it's, it's, you know, been captured in that moment in time. And the thing about it is basically you're creating data, whether it be with a, a, uh, a disclosure form or something along those lines. I don't think it's, I think it's gonna be a long time before we get away from this, this, you know, humanistic need to look at things from a, you know, from a format standpoint. And so you're gonna have the forms, but it's just the data packaged in now. So you know that if you're going to the data that's, you've got from a source, a reliable source, you know it hasn't been tampered with. And, you know, if you think about it, it eliminates the need to do this stare and compare validation, you know, double checking that everybody does, you know, six or eight times through the life of a loan. So, you know, I think we're kind of, we're in a pivotal spot right now as far as supporting AI for the industry. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, I think, you know, one of the, at least for me, one of the biggest and best moves we made as MISMO in the last couple of years was obviously when MISMO was created and, and, and the evolution it's gone through was really very focused in, in the XML schema, right? But I, over the last couple of years, we've now really moved to more of a, we call the ELDD, which is the electronic um, loan data dictionary, which now takes is able to take a lot of those data points, boil them down into unique identifiers and establish relationships between the different data elements. And to me, that's a big step towards how we're going to be able to better get those data standards out into a lot of these new technologies, whether that's what we're talking about here, or it could even just be as simple as utilizing it in GraphQL and, and other areas, right? Which we're finally moved away from that monolithic XML data schema, so. Very much so. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Great. Well, we're almost uh, at the top of the hour. So if, if there are any other questions for David, Devin, or, or Mark, we probably have time for one last question. I mean, I, if not, one thing uh, I do want to say is, Devin, you, you made a point of saying that for some people, blockchain is still an emerging technology, even though it's been here around for almost a decade. 
I, I can't help but think, you know, we are the mortgage industry and to some people in mortgage, computers are still an emerging technology. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> with that, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you, Devin, David, Mark. This has been a great discussion. Uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed it and appreciated you guys coming here, sharing your thoughts with us. And um, hopefully you guys are able to join us in the future again. And if anyone would like to reach out to David or, or Devin and be a part of MISMO, I think it's a fantastic organization. You guys are doing awesome. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for and having us. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.